Okay, so here's where we're going to actually start what I think should be the content for day 12. Um, it's the cubic controversy. And this is the first of two major controversies that we're going to be able to cover in our course. Um, this one, of course, is all about solving the cubic equation. And what we see is that we have... Um, we have some people, some, some different scholars, who are independently working on solving the cubic. So we have a couple of people. Let me give you a little bit of background. There's this guy who's called Fra Luca Pacioli, P-A-C-I-O-L-I, -I, Pacioli. His dates are 1445 to 1514. And this guy, Kind of an interesting guy, and um, he had worked on the cubic for quite a while, and he made a very bold statement in um, one of his writings. It was a book called Summa. It's a longer title, but that's the basic title for it is Summa. He wrote this in 1494, so I'm going to stop for just a second and ask you, think about that date. Think about 1494 and think about your history um, related to the U.S., because we're very U.S.-centric around here, right? And think about in blank, 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 Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Hopefully in your head you're thinking 1492, right? 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So 1492 is supposedly when America was discovered, and we're talking 1494 here. So this, for our purposes, is actually relatively recent history, right? Um, this is less than a thousand years ago, so we're getting closer to our current time. And we're still not even, we don't even have calculus developed yet, right? So just think about all the advances that have happened since 1494 for sure, okay? But this guy, Pacioli in Summa, wrote... Um, that the cubic was unsolvable. And I forget exactly how he wrote it, but um, basically it said something to the effect of um, the ancient Greeks couldn't do it and it can't be done, basically. So that's, that's what he um, had. So look just a tiny bit, I mean it's 1494, look a tiny bit in advance. We have a guy named Scipione, S-C-I-P-I-O-N-E, S-C-I-P-I-O-N-E, Scipione del Ferro, that's his name, okay, and around 1515 or 1520, he comes up with a solution to, and it's a very particular type of cubic. Um, it's x cubed plus bx equals c. Okay, so he comes up with a solution. So, what, within about 20, 25 years of this guy saying it can't be done, we have a solution. Um, it's a very specific case. We know for our purposes there should be like an x squared in there and you should have this guy moved over equals zero, right, to be able to solve what we would consider the full out cubic equation today, right? But nonetheless, this guy, Ferro, has solutions to this form of the cubic, which is awesome, and they're algebraic solutions, they're not geometric. It's awesome because, um, you know, he, uh, has done something that basically it was thought could not be done. But what he does is he keeps it a secret and he only shares with students, his students. Now you can think about that. Um, probably we're in this time period. Remember we're doing math competitions and stuff like that. And probably we're in this time period where having more students gets you more money, it gets you more notoriety, gets you more prizes, things like that. So um, he wants to know something that other people don't know, 
so that he can attract more students, right? So in particular, he shared it with this one student, and I apologize in advance because there are a lot of F names in this particular section of stuff. So this guy, Antonio Fiore, there's like three F names really close together here. Um, well, four actually, but, but three for sure that all kind of are really similar. So Antonio Fiore is one of his students that he shares it with, okay? So um, they have solutions to just this, this format right here. All right. And then along comes this guy. He's actually one of our main central characters that we're interested in. His name is Nicolo Fontano, F-O-N-T-A-N-O, -N -N this guy. He's going to be important. Um, his dates are 1500 <clears throat> to 1557, excuse me. And he's important. His name, we call him Tartaglia. So T-A-R-T-A-G-L-I-A, -T -A -A, Tartaglia. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, we call him Tartaglia, and Tartaglia literally means the stammerer, okay? Stammerer, okay? So that's the name that this guy is given as a kid. The story goes like this. It says that Tartaglia had a speech impediment. That's, that's the word stammerer. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry, guys. He had a speech impediment, and that's how he got his nickname. And the way he got his speech impediment was that when he was a kid, um, he was attacked by a French soldier. Okay, attacked by a French soldier. And we know that he was attacked around 1512. So he was about 12 years old. And what happened is that this French soldier had a sword. And apparently, <clears throat> the story goes that he, um, Fontano, was hiding out in a church and trying to take sanctuary basically in a church and that he was attacked by the soldier in the church and that the sword went through his mouth and that it, it messed up his, his tongue and, and mouth. And so that's why he became the stutterer, the stammerer. Um, so supposedly because of this, because of this speech impediment, he ends up being self-educated like, I guess he was probably self-conscious of um, what's going on. His family was poor. And so he doesn't have a ton of friends, I'm sure. And so he ends up kind of teaching himself a lot of stuff. And what ends up happening is that at a pretty young age, he begins teaching arithmetic to other kids. Because he's kind of taught himself a lot of stuff. So this is kind of the background for this guy. Um, in 1534, so he's about a little bit over 30 years old, Tartaglia becomes a professor of mathematics in Venice. And apparently his speech impediment's not really holding him back from that kind of thing because he's, he's able to make a living um, teaching math. And in 1535, Tartaglia is challenged to a math contest by none other than um, this guy, I hope I just moved it, Fiero, Fiore, I'm sorry, the student of the guy who came up with this other solution. So Fiore, Antonio Fiore. And what happens is that um, Fiore is thinking, 
hey, I know how to solve this one type of problem, right? So I'm going to be able to, um, to, to beat him in this public competition. But what happens is, unbeknownst to this guy, Tartaglia can already solve cubic stuff that's in this format x cubed plus bx squared equals c. So he's missing the guy that only has an x, no power on it, right? No exponent on the x, the, that term, which would be our c guy nowadays. It would be ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d equals zero. So he's missing that guy. So he can already solve these problems. So of course, remember how the competitions work. If you have two people who are going to compete in a math competition, then normally each of them turns in five questions and uh, the one person can solve their five questions, of course, and then the other person can solve their five questions. And so the challenge becomes trying to figure out how to solve the other person's five questions, right? It's normally how that works. But unbeknownst to Fiore, what happens is really close to the competition, Um, Tartaglia starts really studying the cubic and he comes up with his own um, discovery of how to solve the other one, which is x cubed plus, um, how did they list it? They listed it bx, oops, x cubed plus bx equals c. So now he's got Fiore's method, right? So he has his own. He can do the ones with the bx squares, guys, and he can do the one where it's just bx. So he can do all of them. So he can do all 10 problems. So that's what ends up happening, which is really kind of fun. And of course, um, he wins and it's all lovely. So um, Fiore could only do the five questions that he submitted. And so, yeah, he's in trouble. All right, so what happens is that Tartaglia gains the attention of a guy named Cardano. Through this competition, and that's where we're gonna end up um, kind of having it out. Okay. So what happens? There's this other guy. It's, his name is Girolamo, Girolamo, I'm not sure, Cardano. He's an Italian guy. He's from Padua, P-A-D-U-A. -A. His dates are 1501 to 1576. So his dates are pretty close to Tartaglia's dates. He was 1500 to 1557. So Cardano lived, lived longer, but they were born about the same time. So they're contemporaries. Here's what we know about um, Cardano. He was an illegitimate child. His mother abused him. We'll say mistreated him. He was unwanted, basically. Um, so as such, he begins to study a lot of stuff on his own. He um, would like to study astrology. He was actually known for his astrology. And in fact, later in life, he gets in trouble for his astrology because he's... Um, Let's say um, the, the Catholic Church feels that he's, he's committing heresy because he's believing in, in astrological events and things like that. Um, at some point in his life, his eldest son was executed for murdering his wife. So that's an interesting little side story if you want to look into it. We'll say killing his wife, I guess. Um, Cardano was a gambler. He actually had a pretty big gambling habit. And he also um, had a medical degree. So that's kind of a weird thing. Kind of weird stuff. 
He's known for riding a, a horoscope. Well, lots of horoscopes. But um, one, well, a couple in particular, I'll say. Um, one that got him in trouble was riding the horoscope of Jesus. <laughs> so that got him in trouble with the church. But the one that really kind of made him um, lose face was that he rode a horoscope for King Edward. Oh, man. I believe it was the sixth. M that number may not be exact, but it's one of the King Edwards. So he wrote a horoscope for this guy, and what he said is basically that you're going to live a long life full of happiness and blah, blah, blah. And what ends up happening is that this king died at age 16. Oops. Yeah, so he made this prediction, and he wrote a lot about magic and astrology and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, he predicts this long life for this king, and he dies very, very, very young. And it kind of makes him lose a little bit of credibility, okay? So, because he's believing in these weird things. So, something else about Cardano. Let's see. Um, he kind of mirrors pretty closely with... Um, with Tartaglia, because in 1534, he begins to teach math, which is about the same time. Oops, that was a 35. I think I said 35 up there. For the math competition, it was 1535. Sorry about that, guys. In 1534, he begins to teach math, which is the same time that Tartaglia became a professor of math. And in 1539, after this competition, he contacts Tartaglia. And he tells him, hey, I want to um, figure out how to solve the cubic, and I want to publish. Okay. About solving the cubic. He wants to learn his methods, right? So, unfortunately, Tartaglia tells him, um, no, I'm not going to share. So, Tartaglia refuses because he says, I'm going to publish a book. I will publish it myself, is what he says. Okay. So, um, Cardano waits a little bit. And in his mind, you know, you have this, this method for solving a cubic that's these, these are things that have not been done. Like the Greeks, the ancient Greeks struggled with this and, and we need to do this and we need to publish it and put it out there and you're not doing it and so I really want to do it put, to publish this but you're not, you're not putting it out there so why not? Why are you holding this back is, is his question. So back and forth, back and forth. Tartaglia tells him no repeated attempts, repeatedly says no and finally the story goes and it's kind of a obscured story so if you want to you can dig it out a little bit but there's a story about um, that Cardano's in Milan and that there's some kind of a bribe through the Spanish governor to get Tartaglia to visit finally visits Cardano and that Cardano just hounds him to death and says, hey, tell me, tell me how, tell me how. And that basically um, depends on which story you get, but he finally gets kind of a demonstration out of Tartaglia of how he solves the cubic. And one story says that he got him a little bit tipsy. So I don't know if that's true or not, but one says that he just... Um, just kept after it. So uh, finally he, Cardano, learns. And, and what Tartaglia doesn't tell him, he fills in on, him, on his own. Because he's a pretty good mathematician. So he learns the cubic and how to solve it. So, in 1545, Cardano writes Ars Magna. Ars Magna which whenever you translate it basically means the great art. Okay. 
And whenever he's talking about this, he's talking about the art of all of the algebraic and arithmetic um, advances that they've made, including the art of solving the cubic. Now, here's the problem. Okay, let's come back. Tartaglia went through this competition in 1535. So he had both solutions then. Okay. And we're talking 1545 before Cardano publishes. Okay. So Tartaglia is known for like 10 years how to solve these two particular types of cubics. Um, interestingly, what happens is that whenever you look at the work from um, from Cardano, the like say the title page. Look at the title page. Um, I think there will be part of that in the PowerPoint that I'm going to load up, the PDF of it. Um, basically, what he says in the title page for Ars Magna is that um, I've done all this great work. He does give a little credit some credit to Tartaglia. But then he says, I've done all this work. And look, by the way, um, he could only solve two. And now Cardano has figured out and done some extra work. And he can solve all cases of the cubic. So he's taken the work of Ferro and the work of Tartaglia and he's expanded upon it. So he's, you know, honestly saying, and he gives them credit. He says, hey, they did this and they did that, but I've expanded it and this is my stuff and I'm publishing it. And if you wanted to publish it, you should have done it by now because it's been 10 years. Okay, this is what he basically says. So what happens? Tartaglia is furious, of course because he feels like this is my work and I shared it and I swore, it, swore you to secrecy and then you still put it in a publication without my permission. And so um, you just uh, go back and forth, back and forth. There are terribly rude comments made on both sides. And sooner or later, there's this other guy with an F name. So 1548. <laughs> So three years after the book is published, what we see is this student of Cardano's is writing and basically he comes to um, his defense because of course Cardano is his teacher and he comes to his defense um, and this guy's name is Ferrari, interesting enough. Okay, another F name, Ferrari. And what he says to, um, to Tartaglia is he challenges him and he says, look, um, you've known forever and you should share your knowledge with the world. It's not fair um, that you're keeping that knowledge to yourself. And what he's saying, he says is that you are keeping mankind back, okay, because you're not sharing with the group, basically. Okay, so we can't advance because you won't share. That's basically what he tells him, and there is a lot of truth to that, right? So there's this big controversy that happens, and the question is, who owns the material? It's very clear that Tartaglia knew two solutions way, way before, and, um, you know, he had a lot of knowledge, and so some credit should go to him, right? But it's also very clear that Cardano has put in this extra work, and he has done some extra stuff, and that he should get some credit. So in modern days, this is how we would write the cubic. AX cubed plus BX squared plus CX plus D equals zero. So I'm not going to do a ton of work with this right now. I'll come back, um, we'll, we'll do on the next lesson, some work with Cardano's solution. But here's what happens. I'll just give you a little tease and let you think about it. Okay, what he says is, look, you can reduce the cubic and he figures out, like any cubic, um, you can reduce them to this format. Y cubed plus PY equals Q. 
where P and Q are some um, coefficients that, that we, can, we can solve for, basically. Um, interesting stuff about Cardano at this point, he's still writing rhetorically, which means he doesn't have this notation yet, right? This is our notation, so we're making it easier for us to see and understand what's going on. But Cardano is still writing this out rhetorically, so he's still talking about the cubes of a certain number and stuff like that. Um, he's still not, so I'm going to write these down, still rhetorical. He's still not accepting negative solutions. Although he does realize that they're out there, and I can't remember the exact quote about that he makes, but he says something like, um, just because there are solutions out there, they, they're meaningless to us, or they're the, they're the negative, they're, they're the, the solutions that don't make, oh, false solutions, I think is what he calls them. You know, they're not real solutions, they're other stuff. Um, so we're going to ignore those. He also, we know, has a look at what turns into complex numbers, but... You know, so we're talking A plus BI kind of situation. So um, in your homework, there's some work where you have to do some, some work with complex numbers. You'll see that. And uh, he starts seeing those, and he's like, you know, he, I know that these are out there, but they really don't make any sense. And it's kind of like he's discovering things, solutions, and different stuff that will be useful to us in the future, but he just doesn't even know like to what extent these things are going to be useful or how we would do them. So it's a little bit difficult for him because, um, you know, he doesn't understand what do we do with the square root of a negative number, right? Even though nowadays we have actual things that we can use that for. So it's kind of, kind of interesting that he's doing that. The other thing that happens um, in the Ars Magna Ferrari actually starts working, that's Cardano's student, right, the one up here. He starts working on solutions for things that are fourth degree and fifth degree equations. You know, before this, and even at the time of Cardano, there are comments that are going out that are saying, Things like, oh, if you have what we would call a linear equation today, well, that makes sense because it's a line. And if you have what we would call a quadratic today, well, that makes sense because it's two dimensions, right? And if we would call, have something that's a, a cubic, this thing that we've been working on solving, well, that makes sense because it's a three-dimensional object, right? That's natural. We have cubes in nature. But the fourth degree and the fifth degree... Cardano actually calls those unnatural equations. They don't make sense. They're defying nature because unless you come up with an extra axis coming out, right, then we're going to have problems. And so in his mind, you can the, the ones that are useful are only through cubics, right? But yet Ferrari starts working on some stuff with fourth and fifth degree equations. So this is the precursor to us nowadays using all kinds of degrees of equations, right? And realizing that we can, we can use those and we can work with them. So um, I'm running out of time for the video. So I think that I'm going to save um, Cardano's solution for next time. And um, I'll make adjustments on your homework accordingly. And we'll just pick up there. So I think that because I made two videos, it kind of put me behind a little bit on where I want to be, but that's okay. We will make it up, and on the next video, I will talk about Cardano Solution. And so that is it for tonight. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a lovely week.